Okay. You tell us when we can start because it takes some time for the people to be in. 10, 15 seconds. Good morning, Oleg. I don't want to imagine if it, what time it must be in California right now. Right? Good morning. <laughs> yes. Good evening. It's midnight. I just wanted to check it works. Ah, then okay. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know I have to be there in seven and a half hours. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ella He, please, uh, you want to ask something? We, we cannot hear you. Uh, uh, now, uh, now you can uh, you can hear me. Yes. I'm present. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You have any? Uh, yes, please. There's no problem. I think uh, I made a bad mistake uh, and uh, raised my hand. Oh, and okay. okay. We are going to yeah, start yeah. in one minute. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now it's it's I correct it. I correct it. Okay. So I see we have reached uh, a plateau in number of new attendees. So yeah, I think we can perhaps start. Okay, so um, I think we can start. Hello, good morning, everyone. Or I say morning, but I'm aware that it's not probably morning for everyone. Uh, it is certainly morning here in Trieste. So. Welcome to our online workshop on excited uh, charge uh, dynamics in semiconductors. I'm uh, Ralf Gebauer. I'm from ICDP, from the Condensed Matter and Statistical Physics section. And I'm one of two organizers of this online event. The other is Nicola. Can you, Nicola, can you say something? Good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm also, I'm Nicola Seriani, also from the ICTP. Mm. Yes, okay. So um, you will hear something more from Nicola in a minute. Um, but uh, just before we start with the scientific part of uh, this um, um, online workshop, I would like to, to show you just some slides and say some introductory words about what will happen in the next, uh, in the next days. Okay? So um, this workshop is organized uh, by ICDP. I imagine that most of you know ICDP and what it is, but just for those who for the first time are with us, let me just give you very quickly one minute or so, a, a quick glance at what ICDP is. 
So what ISDP is, is what you can see here. This is the building in which I and Nicola, we are both sitting in this moment. You can see in front of our building here, the flag of the United Nations. So this shows you we are in fact a uh, part of the family of the United Nations. And in fact, ISDP works under three agencies. One is UNESCO, the other is the International Atomic Energy Agency, and the third is uh, the government of Italy, which is the third part of uh, the three um, governing bodies of ICDP. Okay. So we in ICDP, our goal it is to, to foster the growth of uh, science and studies in physics and mathematics. And uh, we have always a, a specific um, emphasis on bringing together people from all over the world, and especially also from developing countries. And we try this by exchanging, in, um, to do this by exchanging information and bringing people together from all kinds of places. And for this, we have here all kinds of visitors, facilities, and so on. Now you can already see here from the red and from the blue part of this slide, uh, bringing together people and having visitors facilities that all this is right difficult in this moment in the world with the pandemic and the travel being essentially impossible. So we are trying as good as we can to, to fulfill our mission uh, in an online way. And uh, this workshop, which we all do online, is one of the, the online activities we are trying to do. Now, this is a rather big one from the number of participants we have. Uh, in total, you are about 350 registered participants. And we have people from all time zones ranging from Chile and the Americas in the West to um, China, Singapore in the, in the Far East. So um, I will say in a minute something more about how we try to deal with this time zone problem and so on. But first of all, so again, from ICDP here, a, a very warm welcome to all of you from all corners of the world to, to be with us for this unusual kind of workshop. So Trieste, if you could have come here, this was a normal workshop, then you would be here in uh, at the border of the Mediterranean in Trieste, you see the, the red dot. Um, Trieste has originally, or the ISDP has originally been uh, created in this spot because as you see, it's right on the border. And when ISDP has been founded, that it was right at the Iron Curtain. So it was kind of also a symbolic choice to choose Trieste because it was neither a city of the East nor of the West. It was kind of already at that time an attempt to, to symbolically show that um, we are an international place and we are trying to bridge gaps rather than having iron curtains and so on around us. What you can also see in this map is in fact that we are very close to Austria. And in fact, our first speaker who I will introduce in some minutes, uh, Claudia, she comes uh, from the southern part of Austria. So she is kind of by birth a neighbor of uh, ISDP and of, uh, of Trieste. Okay. So, um, let me say something more about how we try to organize this uh, online workshop. So since you are connected, you obviously know that uh, it is going via the Zoom uh, connection. If some people of you might have problems connecting in Zoom for technical issues or, so, or something else, we're also live streaming the same things on the YouTube channel. You can see on the uh, website of, and you, I've also put it here, there is a link where on YouTube, you can see the live stream of the same thing. So in case you have Zoom trouble or something, you can try to watch us by uh, YouTube. However, in YouTube, we will obviously not be able to answer, uh, to ask any questions. So now um, this brings me to saying something about questions. If during the talks you have questions, you cannot just ask them because we are too many for that, but you can write your questions in the Q&A uh, tab, which you have on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Just type your question. If it's a quick, short question, then uh, we might just read it to the speaker, either during, it depends on what is during the talk or at the end of the talk. If it's something more complicated, just say what topic it is and we might make you speak and ask the question yourself, okay? So the way we try to allow you to interact during the live session is with these Q and A um, possibilities we have in Zoom. Um, we are aware that due to the time zones, which I've already mentioned, not everyone who is interested in this workshop can be live online as you are now. So the idea is the following. We have in this workshop always morning sessions and afternoon sessions or evening sessions in European time, meaning that right now, probably all the people from the Americas are unable or it's difficult for them to attend. 
while for the evening session it will probably be very difficult for the people from the eastern part of the world to attend. For this reason, we will, after every talk, as quickly as possible, it might take an hour or so, try to put the recording of the talk online, such that also the recording can be watched online. And we encourage everyone who misses um, the live talk to watch the streaming. And then we have later on with the speakers a question and answering, which typically is in a different time zone. So for example, the speakers of this morning will be here tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, European time. And uh, where then people who could not see it live can ask their question. Obviously, you can also be now live and ask questions tonight if it's possible for you in the time zones. But this is the idea how uh, we would like to go on. Okay. Um, I'm sure that many things will go wrong um, because uh, this is the first online workshop we have with so many participants and in particular um, also with having a poster session. Uh, the poster sessions will be on Wednesday. We will say more about this in due time. And so please bear with us even when some things might go wrong and certainly will go wrong. We will try to do our best to, to have steam light everything. Okay. So um, for my part, that is all I wanted to say. Let me stop sharing the screen. Nicola, do you, um, perhaps you also want to say something? No, I think, I think you said it, everything uh, that, that we need to say at this moment. So yes. Okay. So again, to everyone, um, if something goes wrong, if you're from Samsung, don't hesitate to contact us. If you have live Zoom problems, then you might just consider to go on the YouTube um, stream and the link to that is um, on the ICDP website, on the website of this, uh, this event. Okay. So having said this, then I think we can move on and come uh, to our first speaker. I've already mentioned uh, our first speaker is kind of a neighbor of ICDP originally. Um, and Claudia is also a longtime friend of ICDP. She has been here many, many times at various workshop tutorials, schools. I cannot even remember all of them. And uh, so while uh, Claudia originally is from Austria, she is now since many years working in Berlin at the Humboldt University. I think it is about 10 years or so that you're in Berlin, no, no Claudia? Yeah, you are still muted. So <laughs> that was a muted test. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, eight and a half years. Yeah. yeah, so we are very happy uh, to have also Claudia here with us. And she will now in our first talk talk about puzzle pieces um, um, for a unified ab initio description of excitation dynamics. Okay, so Claudia, I leave um, the, the stage for you. and. Uh, and we might interrupt you if there are questions or so. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ralph, for the kind introduction. I'm really happy to be here, and I would even be more happy to be uh, in Trieste at, uh, at this time. It's a very beautiful place, um, but I hope it will be possible uh, soon. So let me just ask whether you see my, my screen. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, I brought some puzzle pieces actually, and but I, I like to explain why I've chosen the title. So um, actually, since I moved to Berlin, actually we are, we are working on, on all kinds of, of uh, let's say, uh, pieces of excitation dynamics. And um, well, uh, I first thought that I would tell you a little bit about all these different different things. At the end, we would like to put all this together. Uh, but I changed my mind actually. So what I like to do is more to tell you why uh, we need all these puzzle pieces and why the thing is more complicated than, than I, I thought. So it's, it's more a in very informal, let's say, um, description of what we are doing and why we are doing rather than giving you um, answers to all the problems and all the pieces uh, that, uh, that I'm showing here. So I like to, to mention three aspects. Um, and this is also explaining why things are so complicated, because most of the materials we're working on, they're, they're innovative, they're, they're useful for all kinds of future applications. These materials are complex and they are getting more and more complex and this doesn't make, um, make our computations easier, right? Um, so 
also the methodology of course is getting utterly complicated in particular if you're working with screens function methodology and uh, related uh, things as we will see on the other side we have these very beautiful experiments that are getting better and better so they have fantastic spatial and temporal resolution and this puts quite some let's say pressure on theory uh, to cope with all that's what experimentalists are seeing and finding in the experiment so uh, as i said i've changed my mind i'm not going to talk about all these uh, all these different um, uh, things in detail that we are work working on uh, but i like to motivate why we are interested in in charge carrier dynamics and probably also where we are and where we often um, are getting getting stuck to be honest so i've actually only chosen two examples that are very very different uh, one is an example for a complex material and this example should show you um, what we need and uh, why we need it uh, and then i show you something completely different which is a, a new development and implementation in terms of uh, of um, methodology for completely different materials so let me start with uh, with with the first example and this example is about hybrid materials so what is this um, I can show you a fancy picture. Hybrid materials are basically interfaces, and these are interfaces between two very different types of materials. What you see below, this is an example for in just something inorganic, and on top you have, um, let's say, multi-layer of molecules, uh, could be molecular crystals, could be single molecules, monolayers, whatever you think of. So it's an interface between organic and inter inorganic um, uh, materials. So you may ask me why is this interesting um, and uh, well for this I show you another example because such materials could be very useful for, for photovoltaics for instance. Now what do we need for photovoltaics? Um, we need first of all nearly free charge carriers so when sunlight comes in you want to don't want to have very closely bound um, uh, electron hole pairs and you don't want to spend energies for separating them but you want to have uh, very loosely bound uh, or nearly free charge carriers you would like to have a very high quantum yield so the interaction with the sunlight of, uh, should be very high and then we also need very mobile charge carriers because once you have created them you would like to transport them to the um, to the respective electrodes in order to yeah to, to get some some voltage and current out of it if we look now into the materials that we have in hand or the application that we ha have in hand uh, now and look how they are doing with respect to these uh, properties then we see that the uh, silicon and then the uh, inorganic parts they're doing extremely well in being near or having nearly free charge carriers and high charge carry mobilities but the um, sun sun interaction with the sunlight with the light is not very high and if you look at the right hand side this is an example for an organic solar cell it's completely the opposite so now back to the question why uh, hybrid materials because the hope is that we collect just these pluses and can forget about the minuses if we design a, a material a hybrid material such that it does what we uh, want it to do so um, being the first speaker, I also thought that I should probably wrap up a bit what the state of the art methodology is that we have in hands. I'm not going to go into detail, but just uh, just state, so to say, what the state of the art is. So definitely for everything related to the ground state, we use density functional uh, theory. So in essence, we solve the Cohn-Sheim equations. If we want to go to electronic properties the quasi particle band structure we need to do better so this is the um, the reason why we use many body perturbation theory and i just uh, put here uh, as an example the lowest approximation of the gw approach which is g0 w0 so in essence whatever we get out from the congem uh, eigenvalues here we correct by adding a term that comes from the self energy and the self energy contains all the complex interaction between the different electrons. Now going to spectroscopy, neutral spectroscopy, 
we even need to do better. So we stay within many perturbation theory, but now we solve the so-called beta sal beta equation, which besides having um, Hamiltonian or terms for the uh, many electron and whole system that we can get from the uh, methodology below here, we explicitly add a term that takes care of the interaction between the electron that is exciting and the hole that it leaves uh, be behind. So we can um, uh, describe electron, electron hole pairs or excitons. Now, naively speaking, you could say um, we have all this toolbox, we can apply it to any material that we like. And if you want to do dynamics, we just put another variable in there, which is t, um, the, the, the time and then we are done. Unfortunately, it's not so easy as it looks like. So um, then let me go back to my hybrid material and ask the first question that I would like to answer with you. And this is a hybrid materials, really normal materials in the sense. Well, of course they are, they're complex materials, but in terms of methodology, uh, it's, it's much more complicated. And the reason is, that for the inorganic part that, that we that see below here, we can control very well this state-of-the-art toolbox. We know exactly what we have to do to open a band gap, uh, to, to what, what kind of don't know, um, a functional we need and things like that. And uh, likewise, we, we know the same uh, for, for the organic component, right? But and this we will see in a second now, it's getting much more complicated if you bring these two materials um, uh, in, in contact with, uh, with each other, because then nothing actually is normal anymore. So, but let me address the next question. And the next question, well, you will see it in a, in a second, um, is, yeah, it's about dynamics. Um, so, I brought a solar cell with me, an inorganic organic uh, solar cell, a hybrid solar cell. And this is, of course, just a naive picture from a theory point of view, but you will see it's complicated enough. So how does such a hybrid solar cell work? So here we have the sun. We shine in the sunlight onto our, our device. And as we know, I, I, I said it before, the light matter interaction in the organic part is extremely high. So we will form many of these excitons, electron hole pairs in the, in the organic part. And well, as you may guess from the, from the size of this electron hole pair, electron and hole are very close to each other. So they're very tightly bound. And this is not what we want. Otherwise, uh, we would just stick to an organic device, right? So what we like to have is to either create this, um, this um, electron hole pairs at the interface or to move it to the interface. So in other words, we need to understand exciton diffusion. However, if we have it there, then we are done because uh, the idea is here that uh, such an electron hole pair at an interface would be much less strongly bound for the simple reason that the, um, the inorganic uh, component has a much higher screening. So the electron can move away from, from the hole and being uh, further separated, uh, it's very easy to, um, to separate electron and the hole. And then you can um, readily transport these uh, charge carriers to the respective um, electrodes. Oh, and then whatever you would like to do with the current, you can switch on your light or whatever. So that's the principle. And now looking at the state of the art theory that we have seen before, um, of course, this, uh, this needs um, much more work in terms of our toolbox. Um, in, in other words, um, I have to ask two more questions. So the first uh, a question is how close are we in reality? So what is what we really can describe is the methodology that um, I, I just sketched uh, before. And well, this also brings me to my shopping list because all these dynamic processes that are happening in such a solar cell is far from our state-of-the-art methods that we have in the box. So it concerns transport, it uh, concerns the formation and the, and the uh, decay of excitons, uh, it concerns lifetimes 
and whatnot. So we have a full shopping list. And actually, this is what I meant before. We're working on, on all these puzzle pieces, uh, but we don't, we are far away from having a, a unified description of, um, of all this. Well, I need uh, I put another thing in my shopping list. So here we go. So going back to our methodology and to our hybrid materials. Um, Just one second before I may yeah. interrupt. Because someone has asked quite an interesting question, which is um, how do the charges flow between the two materials? So across this interface, will you say something about this? Or um, I'm not saying something about the dynamic, mm -hmm. but you will see an example um, of, of, of such hybrid excitations, um, of all kinds of hybrid excitations, which will come in, I don't know, 10 minutes or something, or 15 minutes if you. Sure. As you like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me stay first with the problems and then I come with, with, with some solutions. Right. So what is the problem here? And then, then getting back to the question, what's the, um, whether such a hybrid uh, interface is really a, a normal material. So in fact, unfortunately not. Uh, and why is this so? Because as I said before, we can very much control one or the other side, but it, when it comes to the interface, uh, we don't have functionals in hand right now that make both sides happy. And this gives uh, really a problem to the, the level alignment because you have to find uh, some functional uh, that gives you a reasonable density that occupies the, the, the right states at the, at the interface. So this might be hybrid functionals, uh, but um, really local hybrid functional, we have a few, but um, uh, nothing that's really uh, working on a routinely basis. So in, in essence, this question mark stays and actually it even turns green. Why? Because it also, also puts some problems on the, uh, on the GW and related methods. Why is this so? Because even if you say, I don't care um, about, let's say the, 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 the band gaps and things like that at the, um, at the DFT level, because I can do better with GW, still GW doesn't need to give you the right answer. And the, the reason is that vibrational effects are not built in routinely, let's say. Of course, there's much work going on in this direction, but they're not built in routinely in our uh, in our toolbox that we are uh, working on. So it could well be that in the organic part, for instance, the vibrational effects are more strongly pronounced um, than in the other. So and if you ne neglect it, actually, still we could get not only qual uh, quantitatively wrong results, but we could even uh, get qualitatively uh, wrong results. So just as a warning here that uh, the world is not perfect and these materials are far from being uh, normal uh, materials. Just to mention something, it's uh, actually uh, shortly after moving to Berlin, where I thought now I would only work on hybrid materials and all the methodology that we need for this. A um, few years later, <laughs> I wrote an article actually just out of despair because whatever we did, I realized was going going wrong. So, uh, and to just to so, so to collect so what can go wrong uh, in in our state of the art methodology, um, I wrapped up here uh, what what I thought uh, would uh, would be kind of a a road book or a guideline for us uh, for future work. We're still working on all this. So now let me ask now the next question, what needs to be done? And actually I, I introduced already the shopping list. Um, I yeah, put also some more items like a polarization and in particular vibration, vibrational coupling. And this is what we are actually not only working on, but it will keep us busy for the next, uh, for the, for the next years to come. So, I don't want to say that nothing is uh, nothing is is done. There is great work, and uh, we have all the the the, uh, the the speakers here in this conference who have done fantastic work in this direction. Uh, but um, I really want to focus on on a few on a few items um, that uh, in order to um, to make the problems clear here. So. But then I have another question here. So let's assume that uh, our fantastic colleagues and also with some contributions of, of, of ourselves that we have solved all the problems. Now we have a beautiful theory that is doing everything. Um, the next question arises, 
if all this is feasible. And if you look at these complex materials here, then there is no way, right? So I'll show you some example what we can do and what is the maximum we can do. Uh, we probably there will be faster computers in the next years. But uh, for such complicated materials, just think about the beta cell beta equation. We are basically including two diagrams here uh, in, in our Hamiltonian. If we want to go better in methodology and if we want to include dynamical effects, so the number of diagrams is exploding and there's no hope that we would uh, solve all this in reasonable time for a complex system. So in other words, we have not only to think a lot in terms of developing new methods, but we also have to think a lot um, how we can simplify things and probably um, think about simple models that can help us to understand complex materials and the dynamics even uh, without doing full-fledged calculations of, uh, of new theories. So, and this brings me to my first example uh, of a hybrid interface. This is um, uh, on in the organic part, PPP. This is a polymer. This consists of, of uh, benzene rings. Um, they form a chain. Uh, and for the inorganic part, I have chosen rock salt zinc oxide uh, for the simple reason being that, um, well, not only that uh, quite a few experimentalists are working on this problem here in, in Berlin, but also because this combination of materials is, is very nice. It's a, a rock salt zinc oxide is non-polar, uh, so it leaves out a few more complications. There's hardly any lattice mismatch between them, and it's a very weakly bound system, so it's more or less van der Waals bound. Right? So, and we were asking the question um, whether we can predict the level alignment of these two systems. So here, the fact that Van der Waals uh, bound, well, that's, that's Van der Waals bound helps because typically how also experimentalists would choose such hybrid materials by looking at, for instance, the band gaps of the uh, two uh, pristine materials and then think about how can you align these gaps such that they form a material with a size of a gap that's reasonable for instance for a organic um, inorganic uh, solar cell or whatever they have in mind and knowing the work function the, uh, of these two materials at the vacuum level you can just align them with respect to vacuum and then you can estimate what the band gap uh, in this heterostructure would be so, since you can do the calculation, uh, you, um, we can or we, we have chosen the system just to figure out whether simple models that predict this, um, this uh, um, lattice um, uh, or the, 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 the alignment, uh, how, how they would perform, right? So, and we start with something very simple. As I said, this is the Shockley Anderson model. Uh, you know the, um, the vacuum level of two materials and you align them with respect to vacuum. So, of course, also this is already quite complex if you want to do it, um, let's say, uh, as precisely as possible or as accurately as possible. So, you would need to compute at least the, the two. Um, the, two uh, the, the, the two surfaces of these two things. Let's say, okay, we like to make it even more cheap. Um, so we compute with density functional theory. Um, the, uh, now I start with the organic part. Just for a single molecule or a single polymer, we compute the um, with DFD, the system. So we get uh, the, the the vacuum level, the electronic, um, um, the electrostatic potential, and with this, the vacuum level of this molecule. And then we use a GW, a GW in order to get the uh, homo lumo distance of these two. So the valence band maximum and the conduction band the minimum. Um, we cannot use for the reasons I explained before, we cannot use DFD here, but this we can do with GW. It's not a, such a big, uh, big calculation. So, and um, with this, we actually can align, let's say, homo and lumo with respect to the, um, to the vacuum level. 
Also for zinc oxide, we can do something similar. Uh, we uh, compute a slab, of course, you need a surface in order to get the vacuum level. But also here, we do a cheaper uh, calculation for, for, the, um, uh, for the band gap. Uh, in other words, we use, we compute with GW only the bulk system, then we align the inner layers of the slab such that to, to, to be aligned, the electrostatic potential to be aligned with the bulk. And this is the reason, or this is um, the way how we align the, the band gap or the, the band gap states uh, with respect to the vacuum level. Now we have everything. We have the vacuum levels of both sides. We have the uh, position of, of conduction and valence bands with respect to them. And then we can put our uh, interface together. So this is what we get. These are the numbers for the ionization potential and for the, um, for the electron affinity. And now if we put these together, then we get the alignment at the interface, which tells us the uh, conduction band F offset and the valence band offset. So in other words, what you get from this model is a type 2 heterostructure. And of course, you can argue um, that what we have done here is a very cheap um, approximation using just a single molecule and using just the bulk uh, electronic structure. Uh, we may do better. Question is, do we get something different here? So let's improve the model. So uh, in the sense that we go away from a single molecule, actually it's a very bad idea to, uh, to use single molecules in order to predict what they would would be doing as a, as a um, uh, condensed phase. So we take a, a monolayer. Again, we do the same thing. EFT for the electrostatic potential, GW for the HOMO and LUMO states. And we also do better with zinc oxide. Now we do a calculation for a, for a real thin film. And again, I get the, from the GW, you get the, um, the band, band gap states, the band edges. Now we put it together. What do we get? Again, it can read out from here the ionization potential, the affinity, and we again get a completely different numbers, to be honest, but we get again a type 2 heterostructure. So again, you could argue, can't we do better? Because so far, we only have put together uh, information from two completely um, uh, separated systems. So at least on the DFT level, we could do the real calculation for the interface. Right? So, and this is uh, what we do. Well, actually, let me add here. Uh, here we see already a discrepancy between the model and even uh, the DFT calculation. When DFT on the DFT level, you would get or uh, we would get a type one uh, alignment. So again, so you can get basically, and we will see this in a minute, all kind of results that you wish. So let me go now to the improved model we for dft we really get the electrostatic potential from a, from a calculation for the full system but still we can do um, or proceed in a way that we obtain the gw results or uh, introduce the gw results from the uh, from the single entities so and that means we align the electrostatic potential of zinc oxide with the inner layers here and likewise, we align the electrostatic potential of PPP with the, the outer part here. And this gives us automatically the alignment of the um, conduction and valence bands again. Uh, this we get from the GW calculations. And then we can read out the numbers. So um, interestingly, it turned out that we cannot completely disentangle all different effects because there's also some um, hybridization of the state. So there is some covalent bonding that contributes also with 0.25 EV of uh, uncertainty, let's put it like this. Now, summarizing all these, um, uh, all these results, what we find here, um, going from the simple model to the improved Chocley-Anderson to the microscopic alignment and finally GW, um, you see, you can get numbers that are all over the place. <laughs> Uh, from minus 2.7 to minus 0 0.09, basically zero for the conduction band offset. And for the valence band, we have numbers between plus one and minus 0.2. So what GW does, if you really do a good calculation, you get even a different type of alignment. So bottom line is um, 
everything that can go wrong goes wrong, in fact. <laughs> uh, simple models don't work uh, because we get a significant change of all these numbers with every step of refinement. There is effect from the real structure, from the charge transfer, from polarization uh, and whatnot. And in particular, I'm pointed out already, it's a very bad idea to use molecules in order to predict the behavior in a condensed phase. So after all, there is no way out rather than doing um, a full calculation, a full GW calculation in order to get a realistic um, uh, electronic structure. So starting point is still an issue. So this is just starting with, uh, I think, well, with LDA or, 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 or PB. So um, uh, the jump numbers still will change if you do the same with, uh, with some improved functionals. But I think the essence of this work actually wouldn't change. Now let me go to the next challenge, which is the optoelectronic excitations in this system. And they stay with a very similar material. So in this case, it's also zinc oxide, but now it's uh, a, a different, um, it's, it's zinc blender in a, in, in a certain orientation. And uh, it's a, a small molecule, this is, this is pyridine. Again, it's a case study which should tell you somehow what kind of solutions we get from this uh, from these systems. Now again, um, asking the question whether um, a hybrid material is a normal material, no way it's not because as I said, a single component we know that in very often the conduction bands are just shifted, we can use scissors operator in, in order to open the gap here it's completely different because different states experience, uh, depending on the character, a different self energy. And that's why the LDA solution or uh, a semi-local functional gives you something completely different or something completely wrong compared to what you could do uh, with, uh, with better methodology. And this, in fact, you see also when you're looking at the band structure, obviously the bands that come from the molecule, they're color coded in blue um, uh, are much more shifted if you apply the GW correction than the bands coming from zinc oxide that are given in, uh, in, in, in red or in, in, in violet here. So um, I have to say here that in this case, we also have very strong covalent bonds. So it's not a Van der Waals bound system. That's why the color coding tells you that there is quite some hybridization uh, uh, bit between the different between the different states. Now let me go to spectroscopy to the to the spectra. Uh, this is the absorption spectra that we computed with the beta sal beta equ uh, equation, and you can imagine all these excitations are very uh, very complicated. Um, so I've picked four different uh, four different excitons. Um, in order to explain you what the character of these uh, of these are. Oops, sorry, there's something going wrong here. I'm sorry, I'm getting back in in a second. You see, hybrid materials are very complicated. So even Zoom is having, or my PowerPoint is having a problem with them. Uh, I hope that I can get back soon. Don't worry, Claudia, we are still with you. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm, you I'm sharing. <laughs> I'm sharing again. Okay. Um, so I'm back. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, yes. Okay, so sorry for that. Um, so I like to to um, to go 
very quickly through, uh, through these four different excitations. And I start with excitation number one, which um, uh, as you will, will see in a second, is, is an exciton, an excitation that's dominated by, by zinc oxide with some hybrid character. And with hybrid, I mean that there are hybridized states um, in, in Wolf. So it's the lowest state, it's uh, quite strongly bound with a binding energy of 0.5 for electron volt and has the highest oscillator strength. Now, I didn't tell you before uh, when introducing the beta cell beta equation, how we compute it. And in essence, we represent such electron hole pair as a linear combination of all kinds of uh, um, con uh, products between conduction and valence states. And this A here are the lambda, are the coupling constant between them. So what we can do is now we can analyze our excitation in terms of all the conduction and valence states. So the electron and the hole components, so to say, that contributes to, to such an exciton. And so this gives us nice pictures and that they show us that in this case, it's basically the conduction band um, minimum and the valence band maximum that form these, um, these states. Uh, and um, you can see this actually the character from looking at the, um, at the congem um, wave functions. Uh, you see that they're basically um, consisting of uh, zinc oxide um, contribution with little bit contributions in both cases from, uh, from the molecule. So in that sense, it's also clear that the electron hole pair that's uh, um, visualized here uh, is mainly localized in the zinc oxide layer. So on top, you see always the, the valence um, density, so in other words, the, the whole contribution for a fixed position of the electron, which is given by this dot here, whereas in the lower panel, you see the electron distribution with a fixed uh, position of the whole. So there's nothing or nearly nothing, only very little uh, on, the, on, the, on the molecule. So it's a little bit hybridized, but it's dominated by zinc oxide. Let's go on to the second uh, excitation, which I call a hybrid exciton, because as you see here from the contribution of different bands, it really consists of, um, of transitions of very different character. So here we have a pretty delocalized uh, character in K-space in both in the whole as well as in the electron. Um, and um, there you see it's a hybrid exciton. We really have this, this character of, of this band, for instance, is really um, uh, delocalized uh, on, on both the, the, the molecule and the zinc oxide. And here it's less pronounced on the molecule, it's more the zinc oxide, but still a little hybridized. And this is also clear now from the, uh, from the picture of the hole, which has contributions in, in all the regions, as well as the um, electron that has very also pronounced character also on the molecule. Now, there's another, um, let's say, character, and this is probably the most interesting one for, um, for solar cells. This is um, the next exciton, which I call a charge transfer exciton. I'm sorry, but uh, this is again having a problem. I never had such things before, but... This is the moment that normally we would uh, yeah. all swear on Bill Gates and Windows and so on. <laughs> 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 Good old times, uh, but okay. Uh -huh. You can think about problem in the meantime, <laughs> or, or questions in the meantime. Um, yeah, if you take some time, we can ask some of the questions which are open. Um, do you think you are immediately with the slides there? Or uh, I'm there with the slides. I'm just wondering uh, what the problem is or why this happens, because I never had some things before.
what I'm doing now, I'm saving it under a different name. Now I'm back. <laughs> um, Okay. So this is my hybrid exciton and this view, um, no, my charge transfer exciton. And this is very nice, as I said, um, because this is something that you really would like to, to have for solar cells in the sense that um, typically you like a type two level alignment for the simple reason is that you can excite an electron from the um, from the uh, let's say home of the molecule and then it would uh, go when being excited the electron would go to the lumo of the or to some states of the uh, inorganic part. So, and that's why you would have the electron and the hole separated right away and this is what uh, what we see here what uh, what hap happens in the in this exciton indeed so the um you have the uh, in this case it's the opposite actually you have the valence band that means the hole in the in the molecule uh, in the in the in the zinc oxide as you as you see here on top whereas the electron goes uh, to the to the molecule uh, this is what you see here on bottom but it's basically the opposite that you would expect uh, for a, for a solar cell because you would like to ex uh, to uh, to excite the electron uh, in the organic part and uh, that should go to the inorganic part but uh, as you see here indeed we also can find this type of excitations here here we clearly have the uh, the initial state that means the hole in the um, on the molecule that's blue and the electron on the on the in, in the inor, uh, inorganic part and, and, and you Claudia, see. sorry if, yes. I, if i interrupt you because yeah. there's one question which right fits into this uh, okay, what great. you're just saying yeah and um, so margarita marcilli asks how did you pick in fact uh, the different uh, exciton so the third and second exciton inside this continuum is it chosen by yeah. by the localization or how is it done? well actually it's chosen by by visual inspe inspection so olga who did all the calculations she really she went uh, i mean this this uh, this hamiltonian has as millions of solutions right so she went through all this by picking exam exemplary um, excitons right okay. so really wanted to see whether different kinds of excitations can be realized in such a material whether this really happens so we went through all these solutions and then we said okay it re we really find those of this and well going further i'm not going to to talk about this i could could um uh, uh, they are too high in energy, so they are, would be very nice to too high in en energy. But what we see, for instance, is that these types of excitations would appear with longer molecules. So if you go from this pyridine to longer molecules, and we, in the meantime, we also have such calculations, these, mo uh, these excitations would shift down in energy and would get much closer to the bandage. That means that uh, for realistic systems with uh, molecular lengths that allow you also for reasonable band gaps and homolumo distances they could really be realized um, so in this case it's a prototype type study we choose it by hand but uh, we have more evidence that uh, such states could be uh, realized in a reasonable energy window as well okay so uh, let me switch gears. I don't know how much time I have. I hope a few minutes are st still left, uh, such that I can get to the um, to the other example, which is completely different in nature. So it's really a, a dynamic process or more complex dynamic process, um, still, uh, which is um, the resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, still we don't treat it as a function of time. So kind, still kind of a quasi-static picture, but at least it's another step to, um, towards, uh, towards dynamics. So what's the RIGS process? Um, uh, many people have worked on this. It's particularly popular in the 
in the area of highly correlated um, material. And let me walk you through this process step by step. And then probably you can also appreciate our alternative de derivation that, uh, that we have managed to get thanks to Christian Vorwerk in his PhD, uh, um, in his PhD study. So, how do we start? We start from um, excitation from a core level indicated by mu uh, to well uh, to conduction state. So it's it's a core excitation with very uh, high uh, excitation energies. And in order to describe this from a theory point of view, we typically would use the beta sal beta equation again because here we could have very strongly bound excitons. Um, beta sal beta equation looks um, a bit less complicated than in the normal uh, case because uh, we don't sum over all these valence states, we just excite a particular core state and then we get again the electron hole pairs and the corresponding coupling coefficients. Now, um, and then you construct basically the, the dielectric function out of this. What is important to mention here is that um, we can like we analyzed before the electron hole pairs, we can analyze basically where this transition comes from. So these are the, the, the transition matrix elements. We have the coupling coefficients and all this together um, basically uh, gives rise to the oscillator strength. So the T squared is the oscillator strength of this particular core excitation. And then you have the delta function or energy denominator that tells you that we would find the peak of the spectrum right at the electron hole pair energy. So this is just the core excitation. Uh, but then the next step is um, that the electrons, so to say now we have holes in the core state. So there could be electrons from the valence band that would go down in energy. So they would fill these uh, holes, um, empty some parts of the valence band and gaining energy uh, by, by this step. So this is the second step of this process. Uh, and then um, that means that we uh, can describe again by beta sal beta equation, of course, now the um, these uh, matrix elements now here between core states and valence states. Uh, then uh, we again, we have these coupling coefficients that we had before already. And then um, we also need to take into account what the final state of this process is. Namely, now we have, since these valence bands are sort of depopulated, now we have holes there. We have electrons up in the, uh, in the conduction band from the first process. So the final state basically looks like an electron hole pair in the valence region or valence conduction region. And this is how the beta sal beta equation gets in uh, again uh, by describing this, um, this um, coupling coefficient between valence states and core states. So nowhere in the valence region. So that means um, that finally we can describe the overall uh, Riggs process. And this is the novel uh, thing here by uh, again, um, an expression that looks very much like the dielectric function. So again, we have the energy dom denominator down there with the electron hole pair energies here. Here we have the energy loss in the denominator. And on top, we have a, again uh, a matrix or a square of a matrix element. So this is the oscillator strength, if you like, of this process, which is dependent on the excitation, initial excitation energy. And this T3, and this is the nice thing, this Riggs oscillator strengths can be written actually as a product of this, um, of this transition uh, weights of the first process multiplied by the transition weights of the second process with the in energy denominator down there. And this actually gives us a handle to interpret the whole process in terms of excitations between the um, core and the valence and excitations or the excitations between the, 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 the conduction and the uh, conduction and the valence region. Uh, interestingly, and this makes the thing much more um, computational efficient is that this part here 
is independent of the frequency. So let me show you one, one example. This is lithium fluoride, which is the typical guinea pig for whatever we do in spectroscopy. Um, so what you see here is uh, on top is the valence uh, dielectric function. So um, as a function of energy loss. What you see on the right hand side, so this is connected with huge energies. This is the um, core excitation. Uh, both of them are compared with experiments that are given with, with black. And now uh, in the middle, you see with the color coding, the intensity or the differential cross section of the Riggs process. And having these two spectra, at the site, we can analyze basically the Riggs intensity um, and interpret it in terms of the different excitations. Very interestingly, we have a very strongly pronounced exciton in the valence region um, that doesn't show up at all in the um, in the Riggs intensity, uh, whereas only the second peak here gives rise to a bright Right peak. So this is the interaction, let's say, between the second uh, second peak with the absorption onset in the in the core, and so on and so forth. So you basically can relate all these intensities by combinations of core and um, uh, core and valence excitations. Now you can can uh, also uh, look at the spectra. They are, I think, reasonable in, uh, or, or very nice actually, in with respect to uh, to experiment. More important, what I want to point out here, if you would do the same with the independent particle approximation, then uh, you would completely fail. So look, this spectra has nothing to do with what we observe in BSC or in experiment. And we can also visualize this with the, um, with the intensities uh, which are very different. Uh, I'm afraid that that I'm 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 losing already my my PowerPoint. A very different again with um, uh, with these two different approaches. Now this uh, would actually bring me to my uh, last example very quickly, which I still cannot show because the problem occurs again. I'm really really sorry for this. Uh, never happened in my life before. Um, Don't worry, there's a, for, uh, a time for everything. <laughs> oh God! So, but I'm I'm nearly done. Um, and I just wanted to show you one more uh, example, and then a very short summary to be uh, with, uh, so. This is my screen again. So we can also um, uh, use this uh, formalism now to distinguish between, for instance, two different polymorphs of a material. And for this, I've shown you two, um, two polymorphs of gallium oxide. On the left-hand side, it's alpha gallium oxide, where you see that all the gallium atoms that are given in, 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 in green are, have the same coordination by oxygen atoms, whereas in the beta phase, uh, which is, um, is monoclinic, you have a tetrahedrally and octahedrally uh, coordinated uh, uh, gallium atoms. And this is actually a reason they're very similar, these materials, in terms of the band structure, in terms of the spectra, and, uh, but still, uh, in terms of the interaction between valence and core, they behave pretty differently. You see here, you have uh, uh, in, in the alpha phase, a very bright spot here at the absorption onset, which is completely missing in the beta phase. And I can somehow rationalize this by share with you uh, the, um, the analysis. So basically what we have is, uh, this is a gallium uh, L edge. Ex um, so we have excitations from two P states to core states to gallium S states that forms the valence, but the, the conduction band here. And so, that means that you see here the 
that the, the bright spot here can directly be related to the, uh, to the first exciton in, in the core uh, and at the same time to the first lowest energy excitation in the valence, in the valence region. Because this first excitation, um, well, this is uh, between gallium S states and gallium 2B states. So in both cases, these uh, transitions are allowed. In contrast, in the beta phase, we still can connect the, the, the first bright spots to the, um, to the uh, lowest core excitation. So again, it's between P and S states. Whereas, interestingly, in this phase, the conduction band has also very strong contribution from oxygen P and oxygen B to 2P uh, uh, from, from gallium uh, is, is not, not allowed. And that's why we don't probe this, uh, this uh, low energy valence excitation, but only higher order um, excitations in, uh, in there. So, I just briefly want to um, introduce our instrument. This is the most exciting code you can imagine, which is an all electron full potential code, um, which is able to treat core and valence states on the same footing. That's why it's uh, also uh, particularly suited for core excitations and for describing the RIGS process. Um, we have implemented a number of different uh, uh, spectroscopy or, or, or spectral um, uh, probes from a theoretical point, point of view that are all released. Um, but I also want to point to our most recent developments, which are only partly released, but are just waiting for the next release, which should be happen soon. That's one year that's uh, linking spin orbit coupling with HSE, GW, beta, cell beta. We have a self-consistent, quasi-particle self-consistent GW, RICS, full spinner version, bone charges, electron phonon couplings, infrared spectroscopy, and also real-time TDDFD and molecular dynamics. So these are also puzzle pieces to our, towards our, let's say, hopefully at some point, um, unified picture of the excitations that we would like to describe and the dynamics that we would like to describe. And this brings me to my very, very brief summary. So looking back the last years <laughs> that we're dealing with all these topics, I have to admit that we raised a thousand questions. So as I said, everything that can go wrong goes wrong and we really have to think twice before using our beloved methodologies and, um, and see how to develop further. We have got a hundred insights and we probably have solved a 10 problems, uh, but this is how science works and I'm still happy to work on all these problems and also happy to answer questions and thank you for your attention and for your patience um, uh, because all these technical problems that arise. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. So um, you cannot hear the participants clapping, so let me just do it myself <laughs> in the name of everyone. Okay, so um, you can imagine that quite some questions have arisen during your talk. Um, perhaps I can just fetch out some of them. Um, in fact, there are, from the very beginning, there have been some more technical GW questions around. Let me just put two together because they are both uh, linked. One is the question if uh, vibrational effects can be incorporated in GW using electron photon couplings. And very much related kind of the same question is what about cheating in the dielectric function of GW and use an effective epsilon which embodies vibrational effects and then solve uh, GW self-consistent. So. Yeah, um, I mean, um, for the for the first question, yes, you can treat electron phonon coupling on the same level like GW. We actually have done this already many years ago, such that you formulate um, a, a Dyson equation and the self energy that incorporates all these vibrational effects. So as I said, there's, there's a lot of, of, of things going on. There's also this um, uh, uh, for, from other groups they have done it a different way. In essence, it's uh, it's boiling down to the to, to the same thing. Yes, it's possible. Um, we are also putting it together, combining it. The question is, of course, uh, 
if you just do it in an additive way, which is already quite complicated for such complex materials. Uh, in fact, I have to say together with, uh, with, with several, uh, se several groups, so Xavier Gons and, and finally the calculations were carried out in, in, in Berkeley, in Jeff Neaton's group, uh, we, we published vibrational effects on the molecular crystals, but it took years actually to converge a molecular crystal with short molecules. So I think to do the same for a hybrid material is out of reach. So even on this level, but you also have to think about the interactions between these two. So uh, if they, let's say the vibrational effects, of course, hit back to the, um, to the, um, um, to the electronic problems and vice versa. Um, so you would need a self-consistent uh, treatment of this. Uh, yes, and this brings me to the answer to the second question. I think we have to cheat in some way. And in fact, we are also working on, on a method like this, <laughs> one of our puzzle pieces, such that, for instance, we incorporate the, um, the, the vibration ef effects as a superposition of the effects from the both materials. So I think this is fair enough because the vibrations on one side wouldn't be so much, much affected um, to those of the other sides. Um, yes, we, we must do this. But again, it's one puzzle piece, but whatever you do takes a lot of time. <laughs> okay, so um, then there are some more questions. Um, let me again put two together, which are kind of linked. One asks, uh, can we do similar prediction of the vacuum level with a GGA plus U instead of GW? And then kind of linked to this is probably the question. You said that the bands coming from molecules in hybrid materials are more sensitive in the GW correction. Why is this so? Well, uh, yeah, they're, they're linked. So first of all, the, the vacuum level, we don't compute by GW. Here you would really need a, um, a self-consistent treatment. The vacuum level itself we get from the electrostatic potential on the DFT level. And this is typically quite reliable. So I wouldn't expect a problem here. It's more, the problem is more the, um, the, the valence band and the conduction band edges where you need GW. And here the problem is, uh, and this is also related to the second question, that you have to start with a starting point. That means you start with a, a functional uh, that is either more suited for the uh, for the inorganic part or for the organic part. So if you start with vanilla type of functional like LDA or GGA, which is doable, then you would underestimate the inorganic part less than the organic part. So the self energy correction from the organic part is larger than the inorganic. And this of course screws up all the band structure that from the starting point. Now, if you choose a functional, that is a compromise between these two, and that's why we need probably better functional that 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 compromise better. Then the self energy correction is again different, so it would hit uh, uh, still the, the two different materials in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so okay. I've seen the self energy shift of the polymer was much larger than the self energy shift of the zinc oxide because we started from a semi local functional. Okay, and uh, in GW theory, um, can we see multi excitons? No, in GW you don't see excitons at all. Mm -hmm. So in GW gives you the electronic band structure, and the excitons uh, you treat with the beta sal beta. Uh, equation. And these are single excitations that, that we look at. Huh? So yes. each of these solutions of the beta cell beta equation is just one exciton or one electron. Okay, so this answers another question which has been here, which I intended to ask next is, does BSE handle by exitons? So you just answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have to go, we have to be, we go beyond this. That means you need to, uh, you need to add that another, I don't know how many, how many diagrams. Right? Exactly. And uh, so, do, but can one say if this coupling between exitons is important or? That was another question. If there was coupling between exitons. Well, you see in, in the RICS process, for instance, we, we have something like this, like exciton exciton coupling, right? Um, but in the, well, it depends on, on which kind of spectroscopy you, you, you look at. I think at the moment, uh, before going to, I mean, in the organic uh, uh, literature, and probably some of the next speakers could, could, could answer this, this better. 
people experiment find or interpret by excitons uh, for I would say for the materials we're working at at the moment for low dimensional systems and and and, and things like that probably um, trions are more important than than by excitons um, electron uh, or exciton phonon coupling. I would say it's more important, but I, I would, I mean, as long as you cannot treat it, you would always uh, try to or <laughs> tend to, to say no. But I think you need to do, uh, you need to look at it in detail in order to, uh, to tell whether it's really important, but it definitely depends on the material. Okay, so um, Claudia, I think since we are much over time, let me just finish with two quick questions concerning the exciting code, and then I would like to um, refer everyone else to the Q and A session, which we will have. Uh, I think it is tonight, no, at seven o'clock again. Uh, you can ask other questions to Claudia. So the two questions I would like to uh, end with is: someone has asked which basis set is used in the exciting code, and someone else asked if the code is open source. Yeah, so the, the second question, everything is open source, you can just go download it. Um, the basis set is the linearized augmented plane wave method, um, LAPW, where um, we have implemented different kinds of, of, of dialects of this. So this is the conventional LAPW, it's the APW plus local orbitals. Uh, we have implemented a lot of uh, the features with local orbitals because they're very essential also for treating excited states. So we need to complement the, let's say the uh, standard or a classical basis set with additional local orbitals to, um, to get uh, converged calculations in terms of basis set for excited states. So GW, beta, cell beta, also hybrid functionals to have a, a better basis set is crucially important. Okay, so thank you very much, Claudia. So normally we would now clap again. And I must say, so I'm sorry for all the questions. There are many questions which uh, we could not ask, but this is now like in a, in a real on-site conference where also at a certain point one has to stop the questions. But yeah. so um, as normally you would ask over coffee break, the speaker some questions, I can mm -hmm. refer you to the Q&A session tonight where you can then ask more questions to Claudia and also to the next speaker. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, Claudia. thank you. And sorry thank for you. the troubles. <laughs> oh, no, no, no problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, and then myself, I'm now giving up uh, the, my seat to Nicola Seriana, Seriani, who will now uh, host kind of the second speaker. Um, so, yes, thank you. So we are now moving to the, to the second talk of this uh, first uh, session. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. And the next speaker is Geoffrey Hautier from the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. And uh, since we are already a bit over time, I give him the word straight away. So thank you, Geoffrey. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna try to share my screen. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, good morning or good evening or whatever time zone you are. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, I'd like to really uh, thank the organizer uh, for the nice uh, invitation. It's very nice to be uh, here with all of you guys. Uh, can you see my, my screen? Everything so okay? Yes, we can, yes, yes. Great, let's do. So I, I'm gonna talk about uh, a, a little bit of a more applied uh, point of view on how we can use all the tools um, and, and take advantage of all the tools of ab initio computing um, to, to search for new materials uh, using especially large scale high throughput computing. Uh, I'm currently at, at UC Louvain uh, but I'm about to move to Dartmouth in the in the in the US, so I put the two uh, affiliation uh, for that. Okay, so this is my uh, basically the outline of my talk. I will start with some general aspect of high throughput computing. Uh, what do we mean by this? And then I, I think I took the occasion of this workshop to to give actually examples of high throughput computing in action in in three uh, fields uh, that we've been working on uh, for some of the fields for a longer time and and some of the other fields are more recent work, uh, including transparent conducting oxides, uh, ferromagnetic semiconductors, and, and finally electrodes. And if time allows, I will uh, talk about um, the, the sharing of this uh, data set that we're creating through high throughput computing, and especially about, I will talk about the materials project. So material discovery is actually a very uh, cumbersome and uh, time-consuming approach. Um, you, I mean, 
One example that I like to present is when Edison looked for the best bulb lamp filament. Um, actually, it's reported that uh, his team uh, looked at more than 3,000 materials. So he tested 3,000 different materials, made 3,000 bulb lamp. And you can imagine that's, that's a lot of time um, to, to do that. And, and now uh, with all the techniques we have at our hands to, to compute materials properties through ab initial computation, uh, you can help but wonder, okay, what if you had computers? Uh, and so could you use ab initial theory to, to basically screen out the materials that would be the most interesting? Uh, and, and I want to emphasize, you, you don't need to get everything right, but if you get, get a few of the properties that really matter and reduce that number from 3,000 to a few hundred, that's already a major achievement. And uh, I think that's really the, the idea and the, the spirit of high throughput computing. Uh, so you start usually with, with databases of, of materials that can be apothetical material or they can be materials that are already known experimentally to exist. You know the crystal structure, you, need, you know there is a phase there uh, at a certain composition, but most of the time actually there are a lot of properties you don't know about these materials. And then when you start, what you start doing is you start computing properties and you will see a lot of these funnels in my presentation. And why do we use, use funnels is because usually you start uh, computing the properties for your application that are the cheapest to compute. And as you go down, you have less and less materials to, to take care of because you've removed like the materials that are not very interesting. I think if you're looking for solar absorbers, if you have a material that doesn't absorb light, that's not very interesting. You can get rid of it. And then as you go down, you usually go for properties that are more compu computationally intensive to compute. And hopefully at the end, you end up with with a few hundred or maybe 10 materials, something like that. I mean, this is usually the order of magnitude of things we discover uh, that are interesting for further uh, experimental uh, validation and exploration. So that's really the spirit. Um, there's a lot of infrastructures uh, going on there uh, to do this computation automatically requires a lot of work. Uh, and this is actually a good amount of the time we spend. Um, but, but that would might be more concrete if I, if I give an example and the example uh, that I've chosen, the first example I want to talk about is transparent conducting oxides. So tr why do you need a transparent and conducting oxide? Uh, actually, they are used in many applications. I mean, if you have a cell phone, there's a transparent conducting oxide layer on the cell phone. Um, that's how you, you have your touch screen. Um, there are other applications like solar cells. So these are really important materials for many devices. Uh, and these are, this is a really uh, interesting problem for material scientists. Uh, because they are antagonistic properties. I mean, good conductors are usually not transparent and transparent materials are usually not very conductive. Um, so people have come with ways to actually make transparent conducting uh, materials. And the most uh, prevalent way is to actually take a, a material that will have a large enough band gap, uh, but that will give you some transparency, uh, but you also need to have um, conductivity. And how do you do that? You, you just do doping. You dope these uh, large um, gap semiconductors. Uh, you can dope them N-type or you can dope them P-type. And this is, this is what, what works. This is what you have. I mean, in your, on your cell phone, uh, you probably have indium oxide doped with tin. Uh, that's a very common N-type TCO. Uh, where the challenge lie actually is to make P-type TCO. And there are plenty of applications where you would like those carriers to not be electrons, but being holes. Uh, and if you look at P-type TCOs, there's roughly a, a, an order of magnitude of difference in mobility. And mobility is a very important factor. Some application, you really care about mobility more than conductivity. And in any case, mobility is part of conductivity. So that difference of an order of magnitude between N-type and P-type is something that's limiting a lot of application where you would like to have n-type and p-type regions. So how can we uh, use ab initial computing to help us here? Uh, you can go back to the drawing board and very simple uh, physics and, and realize that the conductivity is going to be the amount of carriers you have and the mobility. And the amount of carriers that's related to doping. And there are ways to compute doping with ab initial computation through defects. And then mobility. This is going to be related to effective mass and, and scattering time. Uh, scattering time, I'll get back to that. This is, this is heavy to compute, usually. 
Uh, and so I'll, I'll, this is something we, we compute maybe at the end of the screening, uh, but not at right away. And I'll get back to that. Uh, but we, we, you can see that the, this mobility depends heavily on, on the effective mass. And effective mass is something you can get uh, quite cheaply actually from, from even DFT band structures, um, just looking at curvature of the bands. So this has been uh, really a, a very strong descriptors for good TCOs to look at this effective mass. And you can imagine that if you have band structures, you can get effective masses. And then if you have a, a database of 30,000 band structures, you can look at the effective mass of each of these band structures and find the materials that will give you very, very low hole effective mass, which is what you require from low hole mobility, high low uh, hole mobility. So what you're looking at is very curvy bands and not very uh, flat bands. And this is especially for the, for the valence band. OK, so in terms of um, the, it's, it's interesting to look at actually the physics of it. And there, if you think about that problem of finding a low effective mass uh, material, uh, you can actually explain that the performance of n-type TCO are usually better. Um, this is intrinsically from the, the chemistry and the physics of materials. Um, the conduction band in oxides is often metal related. Uh, you have oxygen, but also a lot of metal um, in, in this conduction character in this conduction band. And that, that metal can be, for instance, an S-state metal, like indium. You will have S-states and, and oxygen P. And that will really bring you very delocalized uh, wave functions and very low effective mass. So the conduction band can be made very small in terms of effective mass. On the other hand, the, uh, the, the valence band is usually of oxygen P character. So if you look at most oxides, this is oxygen P and the overlap is not as strong between orbitals and you get more flat bands. So somehow it is not intrinsically difficult to find uh, low hole effective mass, high mobility oxides. But it's difficult to find, but this is a very good challenge for high throughput computing because we know what we're looking at. So if you have a database of band structures, what are we looking at? We're looking at uh, very curvy valence bands. We're looking at uh, a large band gap to promote transparency, uh, ideally larger than 3EV. 3EV would give you a transparent material. And last but not least, you will have to worry about doping that material with, with, uh, uh, with holes. So you need to have dopability of P-type dopability. It's not like every material can be P-type doped. Um, so we've set up like a few years ago, actually, the, this, the first high throughput screening for, for P-type uh, TCO. And, and this is the funnel again, but this is a funnel that's, that's uh, horizontal now. And you can start with whole effective mass uh, you start with with the database of material. Here we started with six thousand known oxide, and it says these are materials that are somebody made at, what, at some point, and these are in, uh, for instance, crystal structure database like the ICSD. You get whole effective mass, so then you screen on band gap, and then you screen finally on dopability. And this is the easier things to compute first, and then the more difficult afterwards. And we have to do deal with different methods to do that because all methods are not um, equal in terms of the accuracy they have, can have on certain properties. Um, I mean, we do DFT at the very beginning for whole effective mass, and we refine things with GW or HSC as we go down to band gap and dopability. And we also use different codes uh, depending on what we, we are uh, we're looking at. Interesting materials. I mean, this is actually the, the champion in terms of effective mass. This is a 0 0.2 effective mass. This is of valence of an oxide. This is extremely, extremely low. Um, so this is as getting as low as the uh, N-type TCO. You can also find materials that are more, much more exotic, uh, like, like this boron suboxide. And you can see really what the, I mean, the computer picked in, in the 6,000 um, band structures that were computed. The computer picked really uh, curvy uh, valence bands, and you can see they are really curvy. But I'm going to insist on, on one material, especially, which is this barium bismuth tantalum oxide, uh, which is a complex material. This is a perovskite structure, 
and really came out from the screening. And you see that there's very curvy bands, so that's good. That should be good for mobility of holes. And on this material, we, we work with experimentalists and we had an experimental confirmation that first of all, it's, a, it's actually transparent, which is, which is good, uh, but also the mobility we measured in this material around 38 centimeters square of fold seconds, uh, which is in the world of semiconductors like silicon or gallium arsenide, it's not very, very large, but in the, in the world of P-type oxide, this is actually pretty large in terms of mobility. P-type TCOs are usually less than 10 centimeters square fold second. So this really shows how the computing tool can really pick in large database a material that are exceptional and, and predict uh, material and push really the experimentalist to, to try and confirm this material. Um, the issue actually with this material is more doping. And so we are working currently with, with experiments and theory to try to, to increase actually car concentration in these materials. But this is, this is for oxides and I wanted to to talk about some more recent work we did where we moved from oxides to, um, to, to non-oxides. And when we started this work, everybody was pushing us to do oxide, everybody meaning the community of transparent conducting material because it, it kind of makes sense. Oxides are very easy to process. They should be stable. Um, they have all this advantage. But at the end of the screening, what we figure out is many of the oxide we found are not actually that stable. Uh, so you can make quite unstable uh, oxides. I mean, we find a lot of SN2 plus materials. And if you're a chemist, SN2 plus is extremely unstable, sensitive to air. Um, so, so maybe oxide in this application uh, is not the best uh, uh, approach. And also we have very, very few oxides because of this fundamental issue with the oxygen P band of the valence band. So do we really need to stick to oxide? One of the nice things with high throughput computing is if you build a machinery and you've computed 6,000 oxides, it is just a matter of computers to extend that uh, to, to 30,000, which are actually the non-oxide we, we had in our database. And so we did that and we went from 6,000 materials, oxides mainly, to, to 30,000 uh, materials, which are all kinds of uh, chemistries, uh, including oxides. And so this was a, a natural uh, second step for study. And what, what can we do? We can also do something that, that's quite interesting. Know that you start building database is that you can look at trends. And this is, this is people will call data mining, but this is basically being a scientist and put, put data together and, and look at data. And this is the step zero really of data mining. We looked at uh, the distribution. This is the distribution of whole effective mass. And remember you want a low whole effective mass for oxides, sulfides, nitrides, and phosphides in our database. And you can directly see that um, if you really care only about whole effective mass, you would rather have a phosphide than an oxide. Um, and there are all kinds of orbital reasons you can, you can rationalize that, but it, it's very nice to see that uh, from the data. Um, and so if you just look at that, you say, okay, we should work on phosphides, but the problem is that you have multi-properties. You want also to keep a large band gap. And this is a very common problem in material science. You, you try to tune a property and then you degrade another one. Uh, if you look at band gaps um, in these materials, and this is a corrected DFT band gap basically. So it's closer to experiments. It's not perfect, but it gives you the trends. Um, you start with the band, this is all effective mass and band gap for the oxides, the sulfides, the nitrides and the phosphide. And as you go, done in whole effective mass, you can also see that your band gap is getting smaller. And phosphides will basically absorb light much more. Um, so oxides are actually quite nice to make sure you're transparent, but are not very good for getting you whole uh, large mobilities. Uh, so that seems like a, a, a killer for a non-oxide material because you will start absorbing heavily and you will not have transparency anymore. Uh, but one way around you can play with is the fact that the, there are two types of absorption that can happen. Um, you can have direct absorption, they're usually very strong. And then you can have indirect absorption that involve phonons and that are much weaker. And I'm not talking about the, the computing the magnitude at this stage of the absorption, but just the fact that you're indirect will guarantee you that you will be more weaker. I mean, you'll be weaker than the direct absorption. 
So we can refine our search and know not only look at, at band gap, but looking at the nature of the band gap and say, can we look at material that might have a small band gap, like a phosphide with a small band gap, but it's an indirect band gap. If the direct band gap is, is large, then we could, we could have uh, this material to be of interest. So this is our new, again, if you can refine the search, uh, so the, the direct band gap has to be higher than 3V, but the indirect can be lower than 3V. Okay, so we did that and, and I really want to, I mean, this is from 30,000 materials and I really want to highlight some of the materials you can figure out and that you can discover. Um, one of these materials is, is uh, to, I'm actually showing two materials here, uh, lithium and timonide, uh, which is a binary, a very simple binary, another simple binary, bone phosphide. And this really came out from the, from the screening. You can see that they both have large direct band gaps uh, this is, uh, these are actually HSC uh, band structures, so they should be more correct than the, the, the DFT band structure in terms of band gap. And you can see that they have also a direct band gap that are in the visible range, but they are indirect. So you can hope and expect that they will be weak enough that you will still have some transparency in your materials. So that's basically what you're doing. But what you're losing on the transparency, you're gaining on effective mass because you're getting effective mass that are really, really competitive. 0.3 year and 0.2 year, which are in the world of, of semiconductors pretty good. Um, so these are two materials that we found through computational screening. Um, we'd like to go further. And I mentioned that effective mass is one thing, but, but you'd like to have mobilities. That's really the, the thing that you care about. Um, and comes a question of what about the scattering? And the scattering we will actually focus on first there are many scatterings that can happen. The one we will focus on first is phonon scattering. And you can argue that's the one that's most difficult to eliminate. I mean, you can have impurity scattering, but you can always play with the type of impurity and things like that. But, but getting rid of the phonons with device that usually operate at, at room temperature uh, is going to be very difficult. So, so we really care first about the phonon scattering, not that there could not be any other scattering, but this is the first one we look at. And there's a good uh, amount of, of uh, work actually currently in, in the community in, in getting a initial description of electron phonon coupling uh, that can bring you to a possibility um, within Boltzmann transport theory to actually compute mobilities. And the ingredients here are um, this equation, which this velocity are basically linked to your effective mass, but then you bring, so this is, this is the component we're already screening on, but then you bring something new, which is the relaxation time here. And how do you compute this relaxation time? If you care about phonon, electron phonon scattering as a process, if you have electron phonon coupling, you can actually write the equations that you will need to compute a relaxation time. And this is this has been done by several groups uh, in, in the world, and this is becoming a very uh, standard computation um, that you can do. And if you do that, what you need, the ingredients, now you have the band structure, electron band structures, and you need also to have the phonon band structures and the electron phonon coupling, and you bring all of that together and you can compute really a, a, a mobility. And these are the results on these two material, lithium and timonide and boron phosphide, which have effective mass that are not that different. I mean, they are, I mean, this one is a little heavier, but this is the same order of magnitude. But if you do the computation with full electron phonon uh, coupling, and this depends, this is a dep there is a some dependence on the carrier concentration. This is because your Fermi level, depending on what your Fermi level is, um, you you different um, you're in a different place in the in the, the band structure, and the scattering can be quite different. Uh, but the bottom line is that if you go to moderate uh, doping, uh, you get one material bond phosphide, which reach more than 800 centimeters square volt second, which is huge. I remember I was pretty happy with 40 uh, in an oxide. So 800 is really, really large. Um, and the other one you get to around uh, 60, a little more than 60, uh, 65 maybe. So this is, these are computations that are done actually with EPW, uh, which is a, a, a tool that, that helps computing these this, uh, quantities through one year uh, functions. Uh, and this is this shows how, how nice it can be to discriminate materials because the effective mass is not the end of the story. 
scattering is quite important. And this material is definitely way better and way more interesting than this one because of the scattering effect. And this is especially very weak uh, scattering. Uh, so if I have to summarize on boron phosphide, um, boron phosphide shows exceptional mobility. I mean, just, we're pretty sure about that. Um, it actually has high computed p-type dopability as well. So we did defects. I'm not going to talk about that here in the interest of time, uh, but you can compute defects and show that it's p-type dopable. But what's the drawback? You have lower transparency. And I mentioned that it's a small gap material, uh, but it's an indirect gap. So, I mean, can you, at the end, do you lose too much on the transparency versus the, the conductivity? Do you gain uh, compared to standard P-type TCOs? And we use a figure of merit to do that. That's a figure of merit. We didn't invent that. This is something quite often used in the field of TCOs. And this figure of merit precisely weighed the importance of transparency and conductivity. It's very common that if you increase transparency, conductivity degrades and, and so on. So, so people have come with this figure of merit. Um, and this take the transparency, weights it to power of 10, and the sheet conductivity. And this depends on mobi mobility and doping, and this will depend on absorption. But I actually don't know exactly the absorption of this material, uh, and but we can still compute that. And this is an absorption spectra with electron phonon interaction. So in processes. Um, and you can compute that, and you see this is start. This starts lower than 3 EV, um, but this um, this actually is weak enough that you can hope that you have some transparency. Uh, we actually found some experimental data on this material. This is not a heavily studied material, but there are some data points on, on optical absorption, so we put it out there, uh, and we see that the computation is is okay, doing okay versus this experimental uh, data. And if you put all of that together, you can compute this figure of merit. And this figure of merit depends on thickness. I'm not going to go in the, in the details. So every material has an optimal thickness you would need uh, for the layer. Uh, but we compare your copper aluminum oxide, which is kind of the one of the standard p-type TCOs, and we compare boron phosphide. And copper aluminum oxide is extremely transparent. And if you look at this uh, figure of merit, what you show with this this um, this plot is that you can actually beat on in terms of figure of merit. So in terms of this transparency times um, conductivity, you can beat copper aluminum oxide with boron phosphide uh, pretty easily. So what you lose in transparency might not be uh, that big of a deal because it's actually weak enough. One thing that <clears throat> uh, that 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 uh, came out actually of uh, from this, it's also coming with some rules and some new ideas from, from what you find. You just don't want to, you, I mean, it's, I would argue that high throughput computing is not only about getting interesting material. You'd like also to come with uh, some trends and things that, are, uh, that kind of you can help you doing science. And why is it bone phosphide doing so, so well in terms of scattering? Actually, it's a very covalent material. Um, I mean, if you look at the um, bone effective charges, they're around 0 0.56 for boron and minus 0 0.56 for phosphorus, you would expect plus three and minus three in a formal uh, chemical oxidation state description. So this shows that this discrepancy really shows that you don't have a much ionic material. I mean, this is a very covalent material. And our explanation for the very uh, weak scattering is that you have very uh, weak scattering from polar modes uh, because of that. And that really helps compared to uh, many materials, including lithium and timonite, but also all, all oxides. And I think that's one more reason to look outside of the oxide box, because if you can make more covalent material, you might actually have uh, way less scattering from, from polar modes. But this is something to, to maybe test as an hypothesis for more materials and a wider range of materials. Getting to the methods actually of, of, of computing um, this, um, this scattering, uh, one thing that's a little annoying is that we cannot do that high throughput uh, so far. Uh, and if you actually look at the reason we cannot do it high throughput, um, you could argue computational time is not small, but the main problem we faced is that you have to go 
through some process of doing one year one yearization uh, to go to a localized basis set to increase your uh, K and Q mesh. And that step sounds easy to say, but it's a lot of human time. Actually, finding the one year functions take a lot of uh, tweaking and finding. And there are some efforts in doing that uh, automatic. We'll see if we can do that. We managed at some point, the community managed to do that process automatically. Uh, but this has been something that was limiting us. More than computation time, it was a time involved human time in figuring out what the one-year function would be for your material. So we took another approach. Uh, and the other approach is to actually get rid of the one-yearization part uh, and to just do full block uh, wave functions. Um, that seems brute force and, and not very elegant. Uh, but we, we managed to add a few tricks. Um, I'm not going to go into the details here. There are all the, the details are in this recent PRB. Um, double grid, we use the tetrahedron method. And if you add all these tricks, you can actually start to be competitive uh, with, with one year approach. And the nice thing is that you get rid of the one year. So usually it's more computationally expensive, but you, the human time you save uh, is, is actually important. And for us, we believe that's a more automatizable uh, approach. And so sometimes you have to get back to your techniques because you want to go to automation and say, okay, what is the best technique I can use for getting to automation? And so all these results, I mean, this, this new approach is, is um, implemented in Abinit and, and you can refer to this uh, PRB. Uh, interestingly, doing that, uh, we, we started figuring out uh, interesting physics. So sometimes you, you do something for doing automation or infrastructure for high throughput computing. And, and we, we figure out, I mean, uh, my, my, my student and, and a few very talented postdocs uh, figure out that there were a fundamental issue and they started tweaking around something that's uh, linked to quadrupolar interactions of electron phonon. Um, and, and we found that quadrupoles that are usually neglected in typical electron phonon computation, let's say for mobilities, actually are, I mean, bring uh, significant uh, discrepancies and significant inaccuracy if you don't treat them well. Um, so treating dipole you know, interaction, dipolar interaction is very common. And this has been, this is really what opened uh, a way to, to do electron phone coupling on polar materials uh, and compute mobilities and so on. And these are two papers that, uh, that really implemented this. Um, and and this is the Frelish approach, just a dipole interaction. Um, and so if you look at back at the, the physics of it, um, there's not only the long range, the problem is that the, you want to treat the dipole because it diverge and because it's long range. But the long range is not only dipole. You also have different component. I'm not going to talk about those, but you have especially a component on quadrupoles also. And this was, this was uh, this not entirely new, but this has never this had never been um, uh, implemented to take into account in electron phone coupling computation, and because the, the only the blue part was was uh, the focus so far. Turns out that if you actually look at even a, a non-polar material like silicon, you have quadrupole uh, interaction that are long range, um, and so this is a, a nice picture where we take a silicon atom, we move it out of plane, we look at the change in charge density. And we look at the scattering potential from the, um, that's actually no dipole interaction. This is purely quadrupole. And you see that there are some, there are, there is long range interaction. Um, and quantitatively, if you don't take into account these quadrupoles, you have errors around 10 to 30% of computed mobility, including errors in nonpolar material like silicon. So if you want accurate, extremely accurate electron form uh, quantities, I think this is something we, we should start taking into account. Uh, this has been actually reported by a recent PRL, actually from also from, from the group from uh, Bernardi. Uh, so this is a, a common, I mean, PRLs that come out together, we figure out pr pretty much the same physics. Um, and also, if you're interested in the, the details, I mean, please see the poster from my student, uh, Guillaume Brunin, on, uh, on Wednesday. OK, get back to, let's get back to high throughput computing. Um, so transparent connecting oxides, very uh, important 
a field where we can really discover interesting materials, uh, including going to, to electron phonon coupling and, and more advanced techniques. Uh, but I'm going to talk about another field where we can use this data, uh, which is ferromagnetic semiconductors. So I, I really want to insist that this is some kind of, of recycling. I mean, we've computed 30,000 band structures. We have the effective mass. And we use that for another field, for something else than TCOs. And I really, I, I think it's going to be more and more like this, that we use this database in, in many different fields. Um, and the field I'm going to talk about is ferromagnetic semiconductors, which are basically, as the name says, it's our semiconductors. You want large band gap, good effective mass, low effective mass and you want to be ferromagnetic at the same time. Um, and this is quite important in spintronics. Uh, one application of ferromagnetic semiconductors is to do spin filters. Um, so this would be materials that, because they have a channel uh, of up spin and a low spin channel that are, that are different in energy, will filter spins and will help uh, polarizing uh, basically your, your current in a spin up or spin down uh, direction. So these are, uh, materials that can be used in device for spintronics. Uh, if you look at the materials that are usually used for the moment, you have europium oxide, europium sulfide, maybe also bismuth manganese oxide. These are a few of the ferromagnetic semiconductors that have been studied where these device, spin filter device, have been made with these materials. Um, so what's the uh, issue with that? And I'm, I really want to insist, I'm not talking about doping of semiconductors with, with the a little bit of, of a magnetic element. I really want a, a magnetic, that's what's called a concentrated magnetic semiconductor. So something that has a very large amount of magnetic uh, elements to bring a very strong um, magnetism. And there are man, not many uh, concentrated magnetic semiconductors. Uh, the best, as I said, is europium. One of the best studied is europium oxide. This is the band structure of europium oxide. You get these two channels. And look, this is a very curvy band. This is the signature of a low effective mass. This looks like a, a more like a semiconductor. Uh, the problem with europium oxide is it's not stable in air. Uh, that's a big problem, actually, uh, technologically. Europium 2 plus is not very stable and has a low Curie temperature. So what can we do uh, with high throughput computing here? Uh, in general, actually, if you think about it, it's very difficult to combine uh, semiconductors that have S or P characters, like silicon, and magnetism that require D or F, or F orbitals, and that usually will bring you very flat bands and, and not in very localized states. So combining that is, is challenging. So maybe it's a good uh, place for high throughput computing. And again, this is a similar uh, funnel um, for different techniques. I'm not going to go into details. I mean, you can look at the, the paper. Um, and so what we, we did is a screening. I mean, this is my postdoc, Wei Chan, who worked on that. A screening based on, on different things. I mean, you look at this effective mass. This was actually already computed, so not more computation to do. But we also had a screening on, on some indicators of magnetism, including some indicator of Curie temperature. And at the end, if you do that screening, you end up with looking at materials with the largest Curie temperature possible, but also good properties. Uh, as, a from, uh, as a semiconductor. And these are the results. All these dots are interesting materials we found. This is the uh, Curie rise temperature, and this is the electron effective mass. Okay, I've put some of the traditional semiconductors here uh, to give you some idea. And the color of the dots shows you air stability. Uh, this is an indicator of air stability. Uh, this is thermodynamics, basically. And you can see that if you, um, you kind of very dark, you quite air stable. If you look at all these materials, I mean, you can see that we found back the europium oxide here, but there is an interesting material that shows up uh, from this, uh, which is this indium manganese oxide. It has a high, relatively high Curie temperature. It's not perfect. You'd like to be at 300, but it's already better than the europium oxide and shows relatively low electron effective mass and shows air stability because this is basically indium three plus manganese four plus. This is very uh, simple chemistry. And again, this is really from the screening, from searching the database, and you can compare the band structures of European oxide to the band structure of indium manganese oxide. You also get 
curvy bands and these two channels of spin up and spin down. So interest, very interesting material for, um, for, uh, for ferromagnetic semiconductor. Um, what's interesting when you find these materials is trying to rationalize why is this material of interest? Why did it show up? And there are two ingredients here. Um, the pyrochlor lattice, this is a pyrochlor lattice. It's actually known to be a frustrated lattice, uh, magnetically frustrated. And uh, this is why many oxides become antiferromagnetic. But here, because of the frustration, you actually have a preference for uh, ferromagnetism. And the curie temperature is high, I would say, in quotes, I mean, compared to most oxides. Um, if you look at uh, another feature, which is this quite curvy uh, band structures, this is very surprising for, for the type of uh, for, for materials that have uh, uh, 3D metals in there. But what happens here is that if you look at the character of this conduction band, this is indium S mixing with manganese D. And this is the, 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 the trick here to get the localized transport and magnetism is to have indium S, which is like indium oxide, a very, gives you very good um, effective mass, very low effective mass. And also the manganese Ds that actually align well in, with the indium S and brings this, this, um, this wave function that's delocalized in these curvy bands that are good for being semiconductors. Uh, I want to mention that we always use uh, higher order techniques at the end. I mean, this is a tricky material. Um, uh, these states are difficult to, yeah, so we could, we could screen and discover it with GGA plus U, uh, but GGA plus U, I mean, you have some questions about what you should use to have very accurate results. And though, so at the end, the, the last result we did, the last computation we did are with self-consistent GW. Um, these are the ones we trust the most. Uh, this has been published uh, uh, recently in NPG computation materials. All right, let me, um, uh, finish with the with the last example um, that should go a little uh, faster. This is something a little more exotic, but this also shows how high throughput computing can be used to discover a uh, very exceptional material. And this is the field of electrodes. I don't know if you heard about electrodes. This is usually something known more in the chemistry community than in the physics community. Um, and electrodes are materials basically where electrons localize off the nuclei. And that's how you would define them. Um, a chemist usually say, this is like a ionic compound, like an ACL, except that the CL minus is an electron in a pocket, for instance. Um, and so there exist, I mean, there are, these are two very uh, nice examples of electrodes. This is calcium aluminum oxide. We see these pockets are actually electrons. And this is calcium nitride, uh, where you show this, these layers of electrons uh, that are very interesting, for instance, for transport. They've been looked at for transport, for transport conducting materials, actually, for catalysts. They're a very uh, important uh, new area of material science, and only a handful of electrodes are currently known. So can we use um, high throughput computing to discover these electrodes? And we did this search on 30,000 materials, and now we look at real space, we look at, uh, we look at uh, the, the charge densities of given by DFT and we look if some electrons close to the Fermi level are delocalized, are really uh, uh, making this, not delocalized, that's not the right word, are um, localized in pockets that are off nuclei. And you can do that with, we use a mix of better analysis and different algorithms we developed to, this, to really detect those material. But the idea is really, if you have a charge distribution, you can, you can figure out. And when we're doing that, we identify more than 60 new uh, electrodes. And you have a whole zoo of electrodes that we discovered, um, some of them having pockets of electrons, some of them have tunnels of electrons, and some of them have 2D channels of electrons. And something we insist on is these are known materials. They have been reported. I think uh, the crystal structure is known. What's not known is where the electrons are, and that's what DFT can help us figuring out. And um, doing that, we, all of these material were not expected to be electrodes, but we said, look, I mean, these, elect these, these electrons are, for instance, in these channels, making them electrodes. Um, I mean, the most interesting material we found is this strontium chromium nitride. And so why is it so interesting? If you look at our results and what's known in the literature, 
usually electrides don't have, I mean, elect no electrolyte had a 3D uh, transition metal. Um, and there were rationalizations why it's the case. If you have an electron like this that just goes in a pocket or in a tube, um, there's a strong tendency if you have a transition metal to just change the oxidation state of your tr transition metal and to just get back to the transition metal. Um, so the IEEE screening actually found one, which is the strontium chromium nitride, because chromium is a 3D transition metal. And this was a very unusual and unexpected finding. This is the material. This is the channels of electrons that DFT found. Um, that actually is confirmed also so by self-consistent GW. And what we, I mean, if you look at formal oxidation state, if you look at the original paper uh, of the synthesis of this material, uh, they just did electron count and said, you know, this is a chromium three plus. What we said from the computation is that this is a chromium four plus and you have an electron in the channel. Um, and so this is a different interpretation. Um, and so you have these interestingly channels of electrons that you see in your uh, appearing in your band structure too. Uh, but but this is this was a theoretical prediction. Uh, so can we can we look at that experimentally? And we teamed up with with experimentalists that synthesize this material. And the way we found the best direct way of testing if it's an electrolyte or not is to basically um, look at the oxidation state. And there are ways to probe oxidation state like uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And if you're three plus, then you're not in an electrolyte form. If you're four plus, you, you have, should have an electrolyte. So that was our challenge. And actually chromium can be seen three plus or four plus with X-ray spectroscopy. If you're three plus, you have this transition that's not allowed. So you don't have what's called a pre-edge. If you're four plus, you have this pre-edge. Pre um, so this is chromium oxide, definitely not a four plus, definitely a three plus, and you don't see a pre-edge. And this is the measurement. This is the first X-ray absorption measurement on this material, strontium chromium nitride, and you see the pre-edge appearing. So this is a proof that it's a four plus, and this is a proof that it's indeed an electrolyte. Uh, by the way, you can also do some, something like FEF to predict the X-ray absorption. Uh, and it actually fits quite well with from between theory and experiment, the theory having the electron delocalized in these uh, channels. Uh, we also check for the presence of hydrogen, but that's, uh, and this has been shown that this is not an issue. So um, this is an, very exciting because this was really the first time a, an electrolyte was discovered purely by ab initial computation uh, and confirmed uh, experimentally. All right, I will. I don't think I have much more time uh, left. Uh, I don't know how long I have left. Um, uh, well, I think uh, you you can you can speak for five more minutes. Okay, so I'll I'll condense the the last part of my talk, uh, which is on the materials project. Uh, I really want to talk about the materials project. I mean, you maybe might have heard about it, uh, but um, I'll skip uh, very quickly on that. This is this is really the. Uh, the ambition of being a Google of, of materials property somehow. Uh, this is really a collaborative project uh, funded by the Department of Energy in the US. And the idea is to create, I mean, to put all this high throughput data that I talked about to find material, um, to actually put them in, 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 uh, in on the website. Um, that should be well curated data. We try as much as possible, as hard as possible, that it's well curated data. And you can start browsing not only through website, but also through Python codes to search for materials yourself. Um, and so the materials project is uh, growing in terms of properties. Um, this is, uh, you have band structure, actually the band structure have just been uh, done, uh, redone, uh, I mean, lately. Uh, you can also have phonons that just appeared uh, as a new uh, property. Uh, on the on the materials project, we have 1,600 materials with phonons band structures now. Um, so it's really this is a this is a growing uh, database. It's actually a growing number of users also. Um, and not only this is very nice. I mean, we have actually around we passed the 100,000 uh, number of registered users. Every around 2,000 uh, sessions per day, and it's not only a, a tribute to the materials project. And we're very proud of that, but it's also a tribute, I think, to high throughput computing and the use of database 
of ab initio computation. So it's a tribute to ab initio computation also that, that there's so many users using this database to, to search for new materials. Um, and so I want to focus, for instance, on, on one aspect of materials project, which is all this effective mass and, and transport properties. And all this data that I presented on the effective masses are actually present and available in the materials project. So if you want, and this is a scientific data paper uh, reporting on this data. So if you want to do the search for, for maybe the next photovoltaic material or thermoelectric material, you have all this data at your hands. Uh, you can go to the materials project and especially to this, this link. And there's a special page on carrier transport where you can actually look, browse the data as a website uh, and you can find back that born phosphide as very good effective mass. Okay, that's good. That's what I, what I told you uh, before. Uh, you have actually more data than effective mass. You have Seebeck coefficient and so on. And you can click on your bone phosphide to get back to Mitchell's project to see the band structure, to see the form band structure, to see the, the crystal structure. Um, you can have much more data if you click on the, on the, on the, on the material, on much more transport data. And what you can also do is do this binder hub. You can actually start doing uh, searches, not only through a website, which can be not most efficient if you want to do uh, very uh, complicated filters and a lot of constraint search. Uh, but this is a, a small Python code that will give you all the materials that have a certain effective mass and a certain band gap. So basically, we re you could do the screening we did uh, in a few minutes now. Uh, using this data and using uh, a just Jupyter notebook and accessing the, the database. And I think that that's a very nice um, development uh, for uh, the materials uh, project. And it's also in general, a nice development of high throughput computing that more and more you can uh, use this data. Uh, you can recycle this data and it's disseminated to, to many users that can use them in their research. Um, I want to mention codes. Uh, all this is done through uh, codes that help doing the computation high throughput. Uh, there are plenty of, I mean, plenty, maybe not plenty, but there are a few codes growing node. I mean, you can see uh, AAC, you can, you can see uh, IDA, uh, the platform we use for the materials project and, and I used for, for all this work uh, is Pymagen and, and Fireworks. Fireworks is a workflow manager and Pymagen is more a uh, a, a tool to analyze and, and, and the output and the input and, and create input files. And there's also links with, with uh, codes, custodian more related to VASP and ABIPI more related to ABINIT. And all these codes are actually open source. And I encourage you to join the community and contribute to these codes and use them. Okay, on that, I'll conclude. I hope I'll give you a feeling actually of the potential of using ABINITIO high throughput computing to search for new materials uh, in many fields. Um, and I think I've talked, of course, only of the fields that uh, we've been involved with, but there are plenty of groups doing search in, in many, many different fields. This is really a booming uh, field where all the very, very interesting developments that uh, of higher order metals also are, are becoming more and more important to do predictions uh, of materials and using combining simple computation, I would say DFT at the first screening and more advanced computation where we need extreme accuracy before you actually go talking to the experimentalist uh, uh, at the end of the screening. I really want to emphasize the need to share data, uh, to do it properly. There are plenty of efforts to do that. The materials project is one example, but there's also AFLOW. There's also the NOMAD project. Um, there's a lot of uh, efforts from the community to make sure computation are not staying on the computer that nobody can uh, look at except a few researchers, but that is widespread. Uh, if you want more info, you can go on my, my website, all the uh, reference in the papers are there. Uh, and uh, I'll uh, want to uh, really thank all the, this, I hope I didn't forget anyone. This is postdocs and students who worked on that. Uh, and these are on all the, the topics I talked about. Uh, and, and these are my collaborators uh, in different places and, uh, and, and funding. Uh, from Belgian, uh, European, but also US sources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. I will uh, clap for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a few questions from different, both here and on YouTube. Um, so um, 
let's start about the first part about uh, the uh, transparent conducting oxide. So a question is about doping. Would it be possible to 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 keep a large band gap uh, while getting good mobilities by doping uh, oxides with phosphorus or vice versa? So we, I, I mean, I made a choice to not talk about doping too much, but this is a very important uh, uh, part of the screening. Uh, you want to make sure that there is a adequate dopant that will, for instance, give holes to your material. And also you would want to make sure, so we, we're looking at the bulk material. You want to make sure you can basically switch the Fermi level with the dopant. Uh, it's complex because it's not only finding the right dopant, you also want to make sure there's no um, competing uh, defects that could form. And this is something very well known, for instance, oxygen vacancies are often a problem because they prevent P-type doping. So you can put the right dopant to bring holes, but you will create oxygen vacancy. This is thermodynamically what the system wants to do. And this oxygen vacancy will give you electrons. And you can imagine electron and hole can get together and, and just annihilate. It just annihilates the effect of the holes. Um, so yeah, I didn't talk about that, but this is extremely important. And we do that. We do a lot of defect computation. So is um, this all amenable to high throughput or it's something you do? So, so far, everything I've done on defects uh, has been uh, pretty low throughput because this is the last step. So, I mean, you've done all this screening and you end up with maybe 10 materials and there you, you do your defect computation on these 10 materials. Uh, this is pretty low throughput, but we are actually uh, uh, no working on, on bringing defects high throughput, but this is, uh, this is something in the works. Okay. And uh, remaining in the same topic, uh, there is a question from YouTube. Are 2D materials included in the database you used? So if they're in the ICSD, yes. I mean, this is the inorganic crystal structure database. Um, there are 2D materials in there, um, layered, I would say, materials. I mean, you would find boron nitride. It will be there. Um, uh, if per se the boron nitride in one sheet, I don't think, for instance, that's in the inorganic crystal structure database because it's never been reported there, I believe. Uh, but I can be wrong. But so we don't exclude, we don't include. It, it depends if it's in the in the crystal structure database we use. Uh, I know there are efforts of 2D uh, database, uh, including uh, I think in, in Nicola Mazzari's group. And you can bring this, uh, you can always extend your database. I mean, all the tools are there. So you can easily say, okay, you know, want, no, I want to use a 2D material database. Uh, I'm just going to plug in this effective mass computation, for instance, on this 2D. Uh, material database. Okay. And uh, talking about, you mentioned air stability as an issue, um, uh, I think in magnetic semiconductors. Uh, do you test that theoretically or? Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, the air stability is a, basically what the way we uh, deal with it is we look at the oxygen chemical potential range of stability. So the oxygen chemical potential can be related. Uh, so any material has a range of chemical potential. Any stable material has a range of oxygen chemical, oxygen chemical potential in which it is stable, in which it doesn't decompose to anything else. And you can compute that. If you have the energies of all the, the phases uh, competing, um, you can figure out what's the oxygen and chemical potential range. Uh, a material that's very uh, stable in air will have a very high oxygen chemical potential range. And the ones that are unstable, for instance, um, you can see this European oxide, but also some of the sulfur. We have a lot of very interesting sulfides, uh, selenides. But basically what it says is that this will basically react easily with oxygen and, and give you oxides. Okay. So we can bring that. This is thermodynamic analysis. OK. So in, in, in the high throughput studies you've done, which step is the most time consuming? I mean, are there cheap calculations, many cheap calculations at the top of the funnel or the few expensive at the bottom? Yeah, so, so we have much more um, computation at the top um, of the funnel. I mean, I don't have the number. Yeah, we have the number here. So you can see how, how this typically goes. Um, this, is, um, this is, like you said, this is the order of magnitude of 40,000 materials. Then you start screening on magnetic moments and band gaps. I mean, you want some magnetism, you have 15,000. Um, on that, you, you get the effective mass, you go to 3,000 uh, if you want good effective mass. And then, then you, you go to computation related to, to um, 
much more heavy computation. At the end, for instance, the one where we, we, we started doing uh, more advanced computation, including self-consistent GW, we only end at around 30 materials. Okay. Uh, it's actually not, this is not self-consistent. This is actually the very last that we did self-consistent GW, but this 30, for instance, we did 30 HSC computation. Okay. And that, that's band structures and, and, uh, and that, that, that's okay because it's only 30, but I couldn't do 40,000 HSC computation now. Okay. okay. And um, in, the, in the electrides, no, when you do the butter analysis, so the, the electron uh, results as a local maximum. So it's an atom from the point of view of butter analysis. Yes, exactly. That's, a way, that's the way we, we, we treated them. Uh, if you look, some of the codes basically tell you where the maxima are. And if the maxima that we found uh, through the battle analysis is really far from a nuclei, then we spotted this material. Uh, I must insist there's some arbitrariness in, in the way you decide that, but I think the whole concept of electrode has some arbitrariness. When do you decide that an electron has a large enough maxima uh, of nuclei that you call it an electrode? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, other... Um, so what about the accuracy of uh, the calculation uh, present in the materials project? Uh, what's, uh, so uh, it's very difficult to make a, a general statement because it depends on the properties. So, I mean, I can give you a, a very good example is effective mass. Uh, effective mass with DFT um, are not that bad compared to uh, more advanced techniques like GW. Um, so HSC, GW, more, more advanced technique will give you effective mass that are not that bad. I mean, that mean, the DFT effective mass will be not that far from these numbers. At least it's good enough to do very good screening. Um, I never had any issue with that. The only situation that you could have problems is, for instance, if you have changes of bands, I mean, let's say a band shifts, um, then you could be in trouble, that's true. But most of the time, effective mass are, are totally fine with DFT. And we did extensive checks and benchmark on many materials. Uh, we have that published in several papers where the effective mass is, is not that bad with DFT. But DFT gives you also a band gap. And that we know is terrible. So the same computation could give you some properties more accurate than others. So that's why it's very difficult to make a statement on the accuracy of the entire materials project data. Mm -hmm. uh, the only statement I would say is just be careful and uh, teach yourself. Teach yourself, ask questions, um, teach yourself about the accuracy of the properties you're looking at. So if you start looking at elastic constants uh, in the materials project, I would encourage you to just not take the elastic constant of materials project, but I would encourage you to read the literature on elastic constant computed with DFT and, and see how accurate they can be, how inaccurate they can be. Uh, often there are some pieces of answer in the materials project already. I mean, for instance, in the scientific data papers that we often publish with these data sets, um, you can have some room for discussing accuracy. And there you, you, for instance, elastic constant, I think from the top of my head, you can say this is between 15% or something of the experiment. Uh, but I really encourage that any user of the materials project or any database actually, or any computation, it's not only a problem of database. If you run a computation yourself, you should always worry about the accuracy of the thing you've computed with the functional, with the approach you're taking and, and with the specific property. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so I think uh, um, we can stop here. There are some more questions, but I hope there will be time this uh, afternoon to answer them. So thank you everybody. I remind you uh, the, the recorded uh, talks will be put on YouTube uh, soon in one or two hours. So the other people will be able to uh, follow or rewatch it. And we have a question and answer sessions with this morning speakers in uh, about uh, uh, eight hours, right, Ralph? At 7 p.m. Yeah, I think it's at 7 p.m. But first, we have obviously the two other talks at 5 p.m. Yes, yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you very okay. much. Thank, thank you very much to Claudia and Geoffrey. And uh, see you all uh, later today. I hope you like this uh, first session. Bye. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye.